Thanks, Bert. Um, like Richard, this is not my day job, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, Bertie actually worked for me, I think it was 23 years ago, Bert. And I uh, always remember uh, he'd, I'd done, he'd done about two years for me. He was uh, straight out of school. I taught him everything he knew. He was a valuable part of the team. Right on sharing time, he decided to leave. <laughs> nah, Bert, you can't do that. You can't leave me in a hole. Tony, I'm gone. Anyway, after moaning to my wife for a couple of days, she got sick of it, and she said, the shearing's always going to get done, isn't it? If he's that important, what's the rest of your staff doing? And why don't you turn it around and look at it as staff development? And why don't you help him move and, uh, and, and develop his skills? And you never know, it might come back. So that was, that was a bit of a turning point for me about staff development. Righto, Tony and I are going to um, tag team this. I'm not going to try and run over him too much, but uh, we think that uh, there's a bit of work that uh, could be done in our sector around the workplace culture that perhaps is uh, visible on many farms. Um, and I kind of, I wanted to leave a question with you to be pondering while we're working through this presentation. Um, I wonder how many of you have aspired to and reached it or still aspire to being the boss? I imagine most of you. What I'd like you to ponder is why. So just have a bit of a think about that while we travel through this. So um, what is workplace culture and why does it matter? The culture is how we do things around here. It's um, values and principles driven. And you know, for Tony, he's got some pretty core values that are important to him in the way that he operates at, at Coleridge. Do you remember what they were or are you <laughs> forgotten? <laughs> so is this where so, we come in? So this is, yep, see, you're talking there. Okay. So um, look, we, we just hear so much that um, we're struggling for staff and there's not a, staff, not a lot of staff out there, but I think we have to have a really good look at, at, what, at what we're doing and what what are we offering to, to attract staff? And, and some of the core uh, values for us is um, our values are people, profit, sustainability, and environment. And uh, the, the last two you could change around a bit, sustainability and environment, but people really need to be right at the top. And as Richard will understand, probably more so running a bigger property, um, and myself, we're only as good as, as the all-black coach like Steve Hanson. I'm, I'm only as good as my team. And you soon learn that pretty quickly. So people are really important. So with, with workplace culture, it's absolutely about what you're doing. It's not what you're saying. So if you're not doing it, it is not going to drive the culture you think you've got. So behaviour always trumps talk. So why does it matter? Um, always um, in an employment relationship, just by default, the employer holds most of the power. The employee is worried about losing his home, his job. So as an employer or a leader in your business, it's really important to be mindful that there's already an imbalance sitting there, and it's your role as the leader to help address that imbalance. Why does it matter? Well, one of the things that I tell people that scares the bejesus out of them is that every time you turn over staff, there have been plenty of studies that support the notion that it costs you one and a half times the value of that role for that changeover. That's quite a loss to your business. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons. Um, Tony, you've got... Um, the fact that it matters because we want it to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what, what, what do we do at Colourish Downs to, to perhaps stop that turnover or maybe encourage that turnover? So we turn it around a wee bit, or I certainly do too, and I have a really open door policy. So I encourage uh, my staff to, to better themselves and to grow and to look at that next stage and I'm quite open for them to come and talk to me about their next job. And together, uh, we make that decision on whether they should move on or whether that's the job for them. And it all comes back to the fact that hopefully, I always say to them, but you've got a good job here. 
So it needs to be better. Is it better? And they really think about that. And I think that's quite a big part in them actually staying longer than they would. And, 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 and they'll come and talk to me, and then we'll just carry on. There's no, oh, you're going to leave, whatever. It's about encourage them to do the best we can for them, for their career, which sort of goes back to Bert, really. I mean, the sharing did get done. Bert moved on, and we survived without him. So one, one of the key things that's plainly obvious at Coleridge is that they very much operate as a team. And it's that workplace culture, that operating as a team, that means that they are highly productive. Um, working as a team will, will always produce greater productivity and, and profitability. It also, when working as a team, Richard talked about well-being. Um, it's hugely empowering in terms of uh, personal resilience and also your business resilience if you're all working together rather than as individual pods. Some of you might have heard about Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. So at the bottom we've got the physiological needs and don't get hung up on the love and belonging before I get there, but the physiological stuff is about the, the warmth, you know, having a house, um, meeting your food and water requirements. The safety, well that's, that's about being in an environment where I feel safe, I can express myself. Love and belonging, the love, forget about it, it's about belonging, it's about feeling like you're part of a team working towards something <coughs> together. You want a bit of hugging. Yeah. <laughs> um, esteem, we all want to feel good about what it is that we're achieving. Um, and it's about creating that feeling uh, amongst the rest of your team as well. So uh, that's incredibly important to feel that sense of accomplishment. And everybody wants to achieve their potential. So creating an environment where they can show their real potential is really important. For Tony, I think at Coleridge, you know, the respect and trust that... Yeah that you work with is probably fundamental. Yeah, so so really our, our core values are, uh, you know, we treat people how you expected to be treated. So we've got a no yelling, no bullying possibly, whatsoever. Uh, and actually when I look back, and there's a few older guys here, you know, if you look back 20, 25 years ago when we were young fellas, we got yelled out quite a bit. That's just, we just don't have that. Housing, welfare, you know, that's, that's uh, part, part of who we are. We try and look after them. We try and produce a warm house for them. We try and spend a wee bit on their houses every year. Um, and, and I think that's, that's good for them emotionally. Um, we, we, we try and have a safe and well-supported environment to work. I mean, I'm dealing with, uh, with four managers and, and 10 or 12 other staff members, and they're all different and I've got to manage them in different ways. So it's about reading your staff and trying to push those buttons that really work for them. Grow and develop and employees. That's a real big one, as I keep coming back to that. So we're trying to offer more than just a job. And, and if we want young people to come and work for us, you've got to offer them more than just a job. I mean, as Sarah says, they all want to do really well, and those are the types of people that you want. So you've got to grow them. And then if you grow them, you've got to expect that they're going to go out the top and go elsewhere. But with any luck, they might come back. But even if they don't come back, it, it, it just strengthens your, your uh, brand as an employee. Uh, we set realistic goals that are measurable. Um, I don't sweat the small stuff. Um, you know, if, if my staff are achieving 90% of what, of what I want them to do, then that's okay. Uh, I don't micromanage. Um, I expect good planning, and I need to see it. And if I've got an issue, I'll really dig into that planning. But you've got to let them do it. You've got to have them that responsibility. And, and people just thrive on responsibility. The more you give them, the better they are, the more you get back into your business. Um, as I said, I, I have an open door policy about discussing uh, future career opportunities for them. Uh, we pay them competitively. Um, is that, you know, everyone talks about salary and wages and that it's not as big as it possibly is, but my understanding, especially with the young ones, the first they do is go to the salary line. So you have to be competitive. Um, 
But the, the other thing that we've brought in that's, that's been quite a, quite a change for us is working sensible hours. So we've brought in timesheets. Right at the start, we got a bit of kickback. From me, I got a, my board brought that in, and I kicked back at them and said, this is ridiculous, this is a farm, we work when we work. I said, nah, Tony, I want you to record them. You'd be amazed what drops out. And, 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 and it was amazing. So what we're saying now is that everyone records their hours. I get a bit tarry if I see my managers doing over 50 hours a week. They're only paid for 45. Why can't they do that? It's just about time management, organisation, but then coming back to me and saying, Tony, I need more labour or whatever. But that's been a big thing on the way we manage our properties and looking at, 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 at what they do, how they do it, and giving them some time off work or getting them out of it. So um, that, that's really been a key piece, you know, that's, that's spoken to your bottom line in the business too. You know, that understanding those hours. I've spoken to other clients who have talked about the fact that actually for them as the farm owner, it was quite an eye opener because if my guys are doing that, I'm actually doing it too. So, you know, it was a really good checks and balance. Um, just We're just going to touch quickly on um, what sort of culture you might have and how you might know what you've got. And I'm not going to focus too, long, too much on the toxic stuff, but um, you do need to have an bit of a look at that. Um, if any of these things are happening in your workplace, or behaviours a bit like that, uh, there's perhaps a bit of an issue. What does a good one look like though? That's far more exciting. A clearly defined business strategy that everybody understands what their contribution is. High trust and confidence, employee willingness, accountability and collaboration. Employee retention, productive and efficient, and pride and ownership amongst the employees. People will do their very best when they understand why they're doing what they're doing. And if you're able to meet both their ambitions and the ambitions of your business together, then more is going to be achieved for both. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if... if uh uh, direction is pretty important. That if the employee doesn't know where they, where where you're heading or where you want them to head, then how can they how can they get there? So, um, so you know that 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 that's pretty important. So one of the things, I mean, I don't think Tony would say that his workplace culture is a hundred percent great every day, three sixty five days of the year. There are things that do go a bit wrong sometimes but it's about having the systems and the processes, would you say? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're not all perfect, and we, we come across things that, that uh, wild cards get chucked at you and you just got to deal with them. But if you've got a good culture within your team, normally your team can help you sort it out as well. Yeah, so perhaps done a little bit better than it was in your day where there was a bit of sorting out done in the shepherd's quarters. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always came off second best. <laughs> Okay, so what we want to see, and, and um, Richard talked about the fact that, you know, we've got an, an ageing uh, farming population. We've also got, um, in some respects, a decreasing pool of potential employees. Actually, I kind of challenged that to some extent. Um, when I was doing the FIT project to look at bringing a training farm down to the South Island, one of the training farms I visited would get 140 odd applicants every year. Another one um, would get in the high 60s. Tony, we've been around 30 or 40 um, and we're in our infancy. They're there. But one of the things that the cadets that I spoke with talked about as being, you know, why the training farm was so appealing to them was that they knew that the focus of the business was as much on their development as it was on the business itself. So therefore, they felt they would be able to learn in a safe environment without fear of being yelled at for getting something wrong. So if we've got this number applying for cadetships, what else do we need to do to make this a more, um, you know, exciting opportunity for our young people? And I think that rather than looking outside and saying, we need beef and lamb to invest more money, we need primary ITO to be doing more, there's actually quite a lot that we can be doing to improve our reputation. 
So in this age of social media, um, you know, word gets out pretty fast about who the dodgy employers are. I, I think um, with with having the cadet farm at Coleridge and 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 we 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 certainly didn't do it to um, to get people to work for us. I think I think that's really really important. Um, it was because we wanted to give back, but having the cadet farm there and the and the cadets looking for jobs every year, and I've got a couple of boys myself, they very, very quickly work out who the good employees are and who, who the bad ones are. Uh, um, and, 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 they, and they talk about it, you know, quite often. My boys will come home and I'll be mentioning something about, oh, there's a job going here, be good for a cadet. No, no, Dad, you can't send them there. You can't send them there. So I think your reputation is huge, and I think as farmers we need to realise that. And we just need to offer, you know, if you're having trouble employing people, I think you've got to look within and say, well, uh, is, it, is, it, is it something I'm doing? If, it, uh, if three or four people are leaving, then, then all those employees, they, they can't be all bad. You know, what's happening within your business and what can you change to, uh, to help you with that? Um, and, and we're quite happy to spend money on, on other parts of our business to improve it, but actually spending money on on employment and, and, and creating an environment to, 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 to make it a lot better than what it is, we're not so good at, and I don't think we've, we've really dealt into that much. So I agree with Sarah. I think there are a lot of young people want to get into agriculture. You know, there's some really good jobs out there now, some really good careers, and, but we've just got to, we've just got to um, create that, that um, that structure for them to come in and for them to feel safe and for them to feel that they're, that they're going to get some learnings and that they're going to be helped to grow. Um, and, and if we pay them, you know, reasonable, then, then they're really happy. And, and I think you'll get a turnaround. And once you start, it's about building a brand. Everyone talks about brand, but it's also about your brand out there attracting good employment people. And, and I think the the, the, the big thing for our brand is, is certainly our culture and how we deal with people, but encouraging people to do their best and to, and to climb the ladder. So just touching on some of the things that are going to make a bit of a difference um, to how well your people feel like they belong in your business. So you need to define the values and behaviours that are important to you and your business. And then that's got to be communicated, not just talk, but by the walk as well. Set up some good structures and processes. I heard a really good story recently about um, Disney that had done 10 years of abysmal um, filmmaking. They amalgamated with Pixar. They didn't change any people. They put good structures and processes in place and went on to multi-million dollar movies. Same people. It's about the structures and the processes. Uh, selection and recruitment. You know, if you, if you don't think you're getting that right, get some help. There's some awesome people in, in our um, rural community that are really good at helping uh, in that piece. And then take the time to integrate and induct them properly. And that's something that perhaps on the training farm that we need to, we're going to tickle up a bit and perhaps um, do the induction a little bit better. Unfortunately, the year starts in January and you'll know what January looks like on farm. Uh, communication. You can't do too much of it. What's going on in your head isn't visible to your staff. And I think one of Tony's great things is that sometimes he gets it wrong. And when he does, he says so. So own it. Coaching. Coaching your staff in the areas that they are wanting to develop or that you see the need for development. It's not about telling them how to do it. It's about helping them to see how it needs to be done. And be accountable. So if you say you're going to do it, do it. And encourage that accountability throughout the whole team so that when they do make a mistake, they're not going to feel that they can't own it. Um, I've just just thought of something that, that, that might help there. Uh, I was just looking at a young guy who brought me an employment contract the other day and I was having a look through it with him just so he could understand it. And, and in it, the boss had written the hours and it was uh, 7 in the morning to 6 at night. 
and I'm, I, I said to the young guy, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's equivalent to 50 odd plus hours a week, are you happy with that? And well, that's a wee bit tough, isn't it? And I said, well, you need to go back and get that changed. But he wasn't confident enough to do that. I mean, the boss should have never have written that in right from the start. Should have just said, well, look, these are the hours, but farming, you know, we do change and we will work. But that's black and white. I mean, that's the sort of thing that we've got to change. And, you know, if you've got an employment contract that you're giving to your staff, would you sign it? You know, I think those are things you've got to ask yourself. I think that, um, you know, it's, it is all about perspective. I was talking to an employer yesterday who made a comment about, you know, our people need to realise that, you know, on top of their salary, they've got benefits, you know, like the truck. And I was, well, hang on, with the truck, do they have full personal use of that? No, it's for the job. Well, how's that a benefit to them? You know, it, so it's about perspective. Think about it from both sides. So Tony and I thought about what are the key things that we want you to take home from today. Um, and both of us are pretty hot on this. What is it that you are giving your staff more than what can you get out of them? Because I promise you, if you give what they need, they're going to give you so much more. Um, we've touched on this. Um, it takes quite a bit of self-awareness and, uh, and honesty to, to admit what factors your behaviours might be influencing in your staff. And I think that the, you know, the Disney Pixar story I quickly told is indicative that actually great things are able to happen with exactly the same people if the environment is created that suits it. You know, I think we, we, we keep coming back to that, but we just see that as, as a real issue in our industry. Um, and, and I'll refer back to, to, to Richard's um, talk. You know, he's got some of his issues are, are, are dealing with staff. He's also mentioned keep doing the same and you will retrieve the same. People were really important to him. He needs to lift the standards. Um, and lastly, our responsibility to attract people. It is our responsibility as farmers or as bosses or as employers, it's our responsibility to be able to put in a, um, a reasonable program for employers, employees to, uh, to want to come and join us. So again, ask for some help that might be around um, you know your, your advertising for a new employee it also might be around some of your um, some of the things you don't feel you're so great at um, I was excited yesterday a group of Mackenzie country farmers want to have some training coming out of their stock managers particularly saying we want some help nobody teaches us how to deal with people you know, you all go to your accountant and you have your vet in your business. You don't expect to be experts at that. People are a huge asset to your business. And just muddling along is perhaps not going to work for you as, the, as it has in the past. I also think um, you know, if, you get, if you get all that stuff right, um, you'll get a lot more out of, your, out of your people. And I know at Coleridge... Uh, we work reasonably hard. It's not a soft touch. Um, I expect my pound of flesh, but, but we also give back. So we get that back willingly, and I think that's the culture that we need to uh, put out there. So I think, you know, in Tony's situation, he's often telling people to go home. That's a great environment to be in. Um, think about value versus cost, investing in professional development. And I'd just like to say from where I stand, um, the farming community isn't uh, great at understanding the value and training for people. Uh, you may have to get the gorse out of your pockets for some help. Staff will move on. So it's about extracting the value you can while they're with you. And as Tony said, these guys might come back to Coleridge further down the track. The cadets might go away and get some years under their belt and other businesses, but they'll be available to him further down the track because they know that the culture there is great. 
I think the big part of that is, in, and I keep mentioning our brand, our brand is that if you come and work for us, we'll help you and we'll possibly even push you to move, to move on. So you think that you're losing one out here, but there's a couple more just waiting to come in at the back, waiting for these other guys to move on. And if you can do that, then um, you've got it pretty well sewn up, really. So at the beginning, I asked you to ponder a question. Why you aspired to or do aspire to being the boss? And I think there are three key things that most of you will probably have come up with a version of. So that's about the autonomy, the ability to be self-directing. Um, competency, I want to know that I'm good enough to be the boss. And respect, once I'm the boss, I'll have respect. Is there any reason why those things can't all be delivered to the team that you have working for you? And did any of you think I wanted to be the boss so that I could grow other people. Well, I'm all last. Yeah, you can be last. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and, and last but not least, we need to have an enjoyable place to work where we can have a few laughs, value it, be felt valued as employees. Um, because when the going gets tough, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come out of the box for you and they'll really uh, climb mountains for you. And, and I suppose um, this was brought home to me about 15 months ago when I got a wee bit crook and I had to step out of the business for possibly uh, would have been a good eight to ten months. And actually, it was our best year that we ever had. So if you get a good team around you, you know, they always say, what's a good team? Can you step right outside of your business and go away and expect it to do really well? Well, that's what happened to college 15 months ago. So, you know, if you get it right, it certainly works and it adds huge value back to your business. I think, yeah, Tony's got it right, but so is his team. So it's a collaborative effort led from the front, but his team helped build that. Uh, yeah, Charles, thanks, Clifford. Um, Sarah, you sort of touched on it briefly there with your reference to your um, Mackenzie Country sort of chef, um, stock managers and things like that. But um, where do you get, um, how do you go for coaching the coach? Because um, a lot of the people in here probably are the people that are going to be inst instilling that, that knowledge to the, to the other ones coming through the generation. Um, what advice and where do you, where do you say for, for coaching the coach? Okay, well, sorry, a bit of shameless advertising, Charlie, but um, there are other <laughs> outfits like Coach Approach Rural um, that do work with, uh, with the coach to help them learn. Now, the course that we're going to be delivering for the Mackenzie farmers, the farm owner wanted it for their stock manager. They also wanted it for themselves, but they felt that doing it together... Um, may have meant that the stock manager may not have been quite so open. I'm going to be working really hard to get all of them in the room together. So when the stock manager comes home with these great new behaviours, they get it. They all need to be working on the same page. And the interesting thing is if you've not worked um, from a coaching perspective before, sometimes it feels a bit clunky and, and unwieldy. You've just got to persevere with it because I promise you, your guys will have answers that you never knew were possible. Sorry, um, Sharon Watson from Primary ITO. Uh, we also offer a course. It's called Introduction to Team Management. Um, the thing that happens is the, the employees come on this course, not the employers or the stock managers, and I highly recommend them to go first and then the employees because then you're all... Um, Walking the walk, walking the same walk, and, and talking off the same page. Um, and I'm here all day, guys. If you want to come talk to me about it, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Good girl, well done, Sheriff. Yeah, uh, is this turned on? Oh, yeah. uh, thanks, guys. That was that was awesome. Hey, um, just uh, you made a point of um, visiting some cadet farms, and I pretty much I know what cadet yeah, yeah. farms they are. <laughs> and there's some major big um, waiting lists, and and I, I yeah. totally agree. So, you know, we're not capturing those 
those students or those 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 young people. Teratahi's shut. So there's 550 students every two years coming out of that organisation into the industry. Um, so question, a little bit tongue in cheek, do we actually need, uh, is the answer to have more cadet farms? How, how are we actually going to capture those young people? Because they're not getting into the industry. There it's it's okay. clearly not. <laughs> Yeah, we've, both, we've, <laughs> we've both got a bit of a view here. So when I undertook the um, uh, feasibility study, um, and Mel Shepard and a group of South Canterbury farmers got me to do that, um, yep, training farm's ideal because it's, uh, it's, I, it's an easy situation to control a whole range of factors. But what I concluded was if we were unable to find a training farm, that we could set up a sort of a, an accredited employer type program. And part of the, the appeal for me in that was that that way I was also able to get at, sorry, the employers and improve those behaviours as well. So it was, you know, that is quite appealing. Um, the training farm model is, it, it is more expensive than if Tony just staffed with experienced sheep. It's not hugely so, um, but it is a bit more expensive and it is limited. I mean, he's he's got three a year. And Smedley has lifted its numbers. I think the key is to set up uh, a network of accredited farmers, but by that I mean the farm owner, the farm manager, would need to pass another audit because we are relying on them to provide the environment. But it's been one, it's exactly what you say, it's just been caught out and they so talk about it and get them. Yep. The issue is getting buy-in to do that and getting the funding yep. to do it. And we're actually, in my view, we need to actually hurry up. Yeah, we so, do. So Richard is buy-in from the, from the, from the, um, farmers. From the employers, yeah, so. Exactly for that one of those reasons. Yes, so, 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 um, you know, I'll put it back on you, Richard. You're running 75,000 stock units. Why aren't you running what we're running? Why aren't you training the next lot coming in? Because in actual fact, if you've got your culture right, it's not that difficult. I mean, I look at our situation, and we've got six cadets that we're running our properties with. If we didn't have the six cadets, we would have four shepherds. And as I say to the boys, if they're any good, they're only going to stay two years, and then they're going to move. So. Every year, it's like looking into a pup pen. We get to choose three of the very best, and that's what those managers do, whether as otherwise they're finding elsewhere. So I guess, um, yeah, uh, we have thought about it quite seriously. Yeah. So I guess one of the complications for us is we have a big shareholding, and they want their whānau to be running the yeah. land. So Unfortunately, you you're dealing with a way lower uh, type of um, candidate for that, and we have tried it on a smaller yep. scale with one or two cadets. <laughs> fallen over basically because they didn't actually really want to be there. They wanted to be there because their whānau wanted to be yeah. there. So it is, I, I just, I throw so the question, you, we're, we're seriously considering something along those lines. You have some other complexities, complexities to deal with, there. But, um, this model has been run successfully by a group of, sorry, dirty word, Huranui dairy farmers and the model was then moved to Clydevale and the same thing occurred there. So it's entirely doable. I think the key here is to understand if the objection is just around that audit and the requirement to meet a certain standard, do we want you in there if you're not prepared to meet that standard and to understand what an audit would look like? And I don't think it would be huge. I think there would be a need for some ongoing professional development, a commitment from the employer to doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, yep. yeah, I totally I, agree. I think what you guys yeah. are proposing is great. I think it'd be good just to get some action, though, and, and we might need, you know, dare I say it, our levy-paying body to actually help drive this and actually get it get it going. So, Beef and Lamb have been really supportive of this, um, this sort of initiative, and uh, one of the other things that I um, threw out to the team that's running the Action Network Group um, model is that, you know, it might be that we have some... Uh, you know, groups around the country that want to set up and do some work on this, use the Action Network Group to do this. So if any of you were interested in that um, sort of development, um, please come and see, you know, me at the end, or Mel Shepherd is here as well. And I think that would provide a really good opportunity to get things started. 
Um, hello. Hi, Sarah and Tony. Thanks very much. Rebecca Hyde. Um, I, my question is around um, sort of annual reviews or looking at performance. So I work at Ravenstown and that's sort of part of our... Um, that's what you do there and, and a lot of corporates are like that as well. If you step outside the cadet model and into a more um, commercial farm, what's the... Have you seen that working in areas? Does it work well? Having sort of a formalised catch-up with your employees? Well... Um um, obviously, all the all my senior staff are uh, it's a commercial model, so uh, we we certainly have annual reviews, and we probably only just started them a couple of years ago. But look, they're they're really be beneficial. Um, you can sit down, you can have a good discussion, um, you can you can you can ask them what they where they want to go, mm. and and help with that. So I mean, if you if you're not if you're not measuring, you don't know where you're going, or you don't know where you are, where do you go? So. It's, it, it, it should it should be just a given. So further to that, then, what changes have you seen since you've been doing those annual reviews? Sorry, was, what change have you seen any changes since you've been doing those annual reviews? Um, absolutely, because it makes people accountable. It makes me accountable as a boss, but it also makes your staff accountable because you you can go back and say, well, this is this is what we said we were going to do, and this is where we were going to end, or this is where we were going to achieve or, or improve on. Have we got there? You know, people people don't come to work for you to do a bad job. Well, not, <laughs> you might get the odd one. You know, people they want to belong to to a group that's doing really well and achieving, and and that's just part of your culture, really. If you can get that, then uh, then it just grows. Um, Doug McCready from Beef and Lamb New Zealand, and um, I look after the sector capability. Um, side of things and I just wanted to say like really inspired by your you know, I actually came to um, Coleridge oh, quite a few years ago I bought the bought our scholars through I don't know if you remember yeah I did you gave me a hard time about why we didn't have the whole of Coleridge and Lucent oh did I <laughs> yeah. um, anyway just just so just to contribute to the discussion um, cadet farms and cadet farm and there's lots of different variations of what we call cadet farms but that's definitely highly on the beef and lamb radar, and I really uh, just want to put it out there. I think, you know, t a takeaway from here, also aware of the um, ideas that are coming out of the Gisborne area that you mentioned, Richard. And I think that um, it's timely that we sort of pull together, perhaps pull together um, some thinking workshops about the whole area, the idea of um, an employer uh, accreditation program and uh, expanding the number of cadet farms as really, really timely and really, really important. So I just wanted to um, emphasise that that we're on that same pulse. David, uh, yep. i just respond to that. You know, Tony, because we've been friends for years, he watched what I was doing when I was doing the investigation into getting a training farm going down here, and he was right behind me. It wasn't until he took his son up to look at Waipo and Smedley, and he rang me from the North Island hot under the collar going, gee, Sarah, we could do that at home. But until he'd seen it, mm. he didn't get that it was doable. Yep, so, no. you know, there's probably other businesses here that equally could take this on. I mean, what, what my, my, uh, my goal at the end is to have a business plan all set up so that if someone approached me and said, how do we do it, I can just say, this is how you do it. And we're, we're, we're getting there slowly, but... I mean, we're, it's not a closed book at college. We're here to help, and we've learned a lot in the last three years, and we'll still keep learning. But we, we're just starting to, to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel and starting to get it right. So we're more than, more than happy to help any way we can. Brilliant. Um, I'll, I'll uh, close, and I'll just follow with a, um, my own question. And... Um, just took a wee note here before. No, yeah, no, that's right. Sorry, I'll get in front of the camera. The um, j just upon um, we've got the cadetship, obviously that at um, yeah, the Coleridge Downs. What are other ways farming? Well, we should be trying to connect with the people that say aren't starting out as on farming life. Like um, myself, didn't start on sheep and beef farming. Um, are we doing enough as farmers to to get ourselves out there? Do we? Is it? Does it mean we get we have hope and days on farms? How do we attract people? that aren't farming, to farming? Is it something we should target? No, 
that's a that's a really good question, Bert. Um, I think it goes further than that. That the that the the, the urban and the rural gap, as was spoken by other speakers, is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I think if I look back in my in my father's day, they always had a relationship with the with the farmer, whether it was his uncle or his aunt or his cousin or whatever. But we're just not getting that now. Um, Teratahi is a is a huge loss to us. You know, we were getting a lot of a lot of uh, urban kids going going to that sort of thing. Um, we probably need more out in the schools, Sarah. Um, yep. So, I mean, at Coleridge, there's sort of up to 100 kids that come to the Open Day every year. Another shameless plug, Open Day is? Uh, next Sunday. Sunday July the Saturday. 7th. <laughs> Sorry. 7th. Um, but interesting to note that, um, you know, a couple of our very best cadets at Coleridge are actually through and through town kids. One of them's down here listening to the rubbish that we talk. So, you know, we are, I think, we are speaking to them. They are being given opportunities to engage with the agricultural sector. It's stage two where we're not grabbing them. I think that's the piece that's missing. And, and that's probably to work on our physical farms, but if you see what's happening, uh, out there in the future and the huge gains that that technology is going to have and uh, that's going to attract a lot of a lot of people to a thing especially from the from the um, from the urban side of it so uh, yeah it's, it's a difficult one but oh, no, without any further ado I'd, I'd like to uh, to wrap the one up